When the Australian government announced in July 2023 that Hanwha Defence Australia's AS-21 Redback would be the Army's next infantry fighting vehicle under the Land 400 Phase 3 program, it marked more than just the end of a competitive evaluation. It was the conclusion of a contest in which two very different industrial philosophies, South Korea's adaptable, export-oriented approach and Germany's traditional, standardized model, met on Australian proving grounds. The decision to select the Redback over the Rheinmetall Lynx KF-41 was not driven by a single technical metric, but by a convergence of performance, politics, industry policy, and strategic geography. Australia's procurement system, for all its bureaucracy, is acutely aware that in the Indo-Pacific, the operational environment is defined as much by climate and terrain as by any adversary's order of battle. The Redback did not simply pass its trials. It convinced decision makers that it could be built in Australia, maintained in Australia, and adapted to the Army's evolving role in a maritime strategy where the tropics and the coast are the front lines. The Land 400 Phase 3 program was born of necessity. The M113AS4s that have served since the Vietnam War era, modernized repeatedly, are relics of an era when armored vehicles were lighter, simpler, and intended primarily for troop transport rather than combined arms combat. Today, the Army demands a platform with high protection against mines and improvised explosives, networked firepower that can overmatch infantry threats, and mobility not only across open plains, but in rain-soaked paddies, narrow streets, and jungle edges. The Redback entered the competition with the advantage of being a new design, purpose-built in the 21st century for the conditions faced by South Korea, a nation with hot summers, monsoon rains, and dense coastal urbanization. That environmental heritage mattered. In the formal risk mitigation activity, the Redback demonstrated that it could carry its full complement of troops while offering a smooth ride from its in-arm suspension system, a powerful air conditioning setup to protect crew endurance in oppressive humidity, and a turret with integrated sensors and remote weapon stations. Human factors evaluations found the vehicle quieter, less fatiguing, and more habitable than its competitor. Small comforts that become strategic advantages when operations stretch into weeks. But capability on paper is not enough in Canberra's calculus. The industrial offer was equally decisive. Hanwha's commitment to manufacture all 129 Redbacks at its new Armored Vehicle Center of Excellence in Geelong was not just a political sweetener. It was a strategic statement. By producing the vehicles domestically, Australia secures supply chain sovereignty, ensures a trained workforce for decades of sustainment, and opens the door for exports into a region where Hanwha's market reach is already expanding. In a world where European and American defense supply chains are stretched by competing demands, diversifying into a trusted Asian partner mitigates strategic risk. The Redback selection also deepens defense ties with South Korea, an increasingly important security partner in the Indo-Pacific. Seoul's strategic position as both a U.S. ally and a capable independent manufacturer means that cooperation carries political weight, signaling Australia's intent to widen its defense partnerships beyond its traditional suppliers. For South Korea, the Redback win in Australia is a validation of its emergence as a top-tier arms exporter. For Australia, it is a reminder that geopolitical diversification is not only about diplomacy, but about who can deliver steel, electronics, and armor when the strategic clock is ticking. If the Redback selection was grounded in performance and policy, its operational relevance is rooted in geography. Australia's defense planners know that the Army's most likely deployments will not be in temperate plains or deserts, but in the wet tropics of Northern Australia, the archipelagos of the South Pacific, and the humid littorals of Southeast Asia. In those environments, mobility is not a given. It must be engineered. 
the Redback's wide tracks distribute weight to achieve ground pressures comparable to much lighter vehicles, giving it surprising capability in soft soils and muddy ground. The in-arm hydropneumatic suspension allows each track unit to adapt to uneven surfaces, keeping the vehicle stable and the crew's weapons on target, even in rutted, rain-slick terrain. In the tropics, where heat can sap human endurance faster than combat stress, the Redback's environmental control system is a force multiplier. Comfortable troops are alert troops, and alert troops react faster in an ambush. Ergonomic seating, reduced vibration, and lower internal noise may seem like luxuries, but they are in fact investments in sustained combat effectiveness. When patrols last days or weeks, fatigue kills more surely than any bullet. The Redback's relevance extends to coastal and littoral warfare, a domain that has moved to the center of Australian Army doctrine. In any future conflict in the Indo-Pacific, control of ports, airfields, and coastal cities will be decisive. These are environments where the enemy's weapons may range from drones and guided missiles to snipers and roadside explosives. The Redback's combination of heavy armor, advanced sensors, and optional active protection systems provides the survivability needed to advance through built-up areas while supporting dismounted infantry. Integrated into joint operations, the Redback can move from ship to shore in amphibious landings, provide immediate armored support to beachheads, and push inland to secure key infrastructure before an adversary can reinforce. Its digital architecture allows seamless communication with naval and air assets, turning the IFV from a mere transporter into a node in a wider kill web. This is not the armored warfare of El Alamein. It is the armored warfare of the 21st century Indo-Pacific, in which land forces fight as part of a single, integrated maritime strategy. The decision to choose the Redback is thus not an isolated procurement choice but part of a larger transformation of the Australian Army, from a force optimized for continental defense to one ready to operate in the contested littoral zones of the region. It is a bet that the Army's future relevance will be measured not by the tonnage of its armor, but by its ability to project power ashore, under armor, in climates and terrains that punish the unprepared. Politically, the Redback's arrival in the late 2020s will coincide with other major capability introductions. The hunter-class frigates, new amphibious vessels, and long-range fires that together signal a maturation of Australia's deterrence posture. In that context, the Redback is not just a fighting vehicle. It is a symbol of industrial independence, alliance diversification, and environmental readiness. By marrying South Korean engineering to Australian production, the program has created a capability that is at once foreign designed and domestically owned. A fusion that reflects the reality of a middle power preparing for uncertain times in a volatile region. In the years to come, the true test of the Redback will not be in trials but in operations, exercises, and the quiet day-to-day -day grind of readiness. If it can deliver the promised blend of protection, mobility, and integration, it will serve as the steel backbone of the Army's infantry formations, carrying Australian soldiers into battle in the places where sea meets land and where climate can be as formidable an enemy as any armed force. The Redback is, in essence, a recognition that in the Indo-Pacific, geography is destiny, and that destiny demands an armored force built not for the parade ground, but for the humid, salt-laden air of the coast and the dense, rain-heavy heat of the tropics. Its selection was a political act, an industrial act, and above all, a strategic act, one that will shape the Army's fighting edge for decades. For those who follow the evolving shape of Australia's defense posture, the Redback is a story worth watching closely. Support the channel, follow, and subscribe to stay informed on the latest developments in Australian military capability, from armored vehicles to maritime power, because in the contest for regional security, knowledge is as vital as armor.